Hi ladies, it's Rita. I am so excited to take just a few minutes to open God's Word with you. If you're like me, you've missed a chance to be in Bible class with other women and open the Word. And it has been suggested to me several times, could we do a video? Could we study together virtually? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take just a few minutes to do that. Hopefully you can watch this at any point during the week, but I know we're not together on Wednesday evenings. So maybe this could take the place of the Wednesday evening or the Friday. Friday morning Bible class. So what I want to do is take a, uh, a look at what I'm going to call defining moments. Uh, maybe verses in the Bible that defined who a person was, or maybe an event that really spoke to the essence of that person. So in this defining moments series, we're going to take these stories and we're going to then apply them to our lives right here today as Christian women because all of these stories were given to us by the Holy Spirit for a purpose and that's to change the way we live and to grow us closer to the heart of Jesus. So I'm going to start with Genesis, with the first story of the Bible and the first woman in the Bible, Eve. Now if you don't have your Bibles with you, just put me on pause for a moment. Go get your Bible and come back. And when you're back, turn to Genesis chapter 3. We'll look at the story of Eve together. So I'm going to start reading in verse 1, and I want you to follow along. If you've got a pen or a pencil, if you don't mind writing in your Bibles, I say go for it. I have so many things written in my Bibles, in my Bible margins, that help me just recall things that people have said and study better and deeper. So let's start with verse 1 of chapter 3, and this is the first instance and story we have of Eve. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now I'm going to stop right here because I have to tell you, I wish we could see a video of this because we only get the words of what Satan said and what we don't get is the tone and you and I know very well that tone is very important to what you mean. So I have a feeling, even though we don't get the tone, that Satan, that serpent, was saying this in a very derogatory manner. Maybe even if, if serpents could roll eyes, I don't know if they could or not, but I could imagine just an eye roll going on here. I can imagine that he said it more like this, has God indeed said you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? Do you realize that this is the very first question in all of Scripture? And it's made by a serpent, by the evil one, to question who God was. To question the very deity and essence of God. Isn't that kind of sad? Now, the story goes on. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Look at what is happening right here. Eve is allowing a humongous gift to be given to the evil one. She is gifting him with her time. She should not have done that. If you go back and look at this story, as soon as Satan says, did God really say that and undermine God and question God's authority, that should have been enough for Eve to know, I do not need to spend time with him. Now, she might have wanted to go ahead and answer the question. He said this. He said we could eat this. He said we couldn't touch this. But that should have been it. That should have been her exit strategy. But look, Eve stays with the serpent. In fact, for six verses, she stays. She offers him a tremendous gift, the gift of her time. And in that time, look what he does. So, I can just imagine him holding out the fruit. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, 
that it was pleasant to her eyes and a tree desirable to make her wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. Have you ever thought that right there, what Satan's doing is using the same tactic he's gonna use many, many years later when he tempts Jesus in the wilderness? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Look at this, when she saw it looked good, lust of the eyes. When it was good to eat, lust of the flesh. And it would make her wise, oh, the pride of life. Same tactics that he used with Jesus. When she saw that, she ate. There's the first sin. She ate. But look at the next verse. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, I love to put myself in the middle of stories. I love to think, what can I learn from this story? What would that have been like? What would I have said? And I'm going to suggest that there is a tremendous amount of dialogue going on between those two sentences that we don't get. Because Eve is tempted and deceived, and she eats, and then in the very next sentence, she gives it to her husband and he eats. Don't you think they had words in between those two, two sentences? Don't you? Can't you just imagine Adam saying, what are you doing? Stop. You know God said don't eat that. In fact, he even said, don't even touch it. What are you thinking? Don't you know there was a little bit of convincing on Eve's part to get Adam to partake it? But all we're told is she gave it to the man and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves coverings. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I think that's the most incredible vision of what uh, the Garden of Eden would have been like. Look at what it says, that they heard the sound of God walking through their garden in the cool of the day. He wasn't afraid because of that. It does say they were afraid and they hid themselves, but it wasn't because they were afraid of God walking. It sounds as if this was what happened all the time. The sound of God walking didn't put fear in them. What put fear was they knew they had done wrong. And we know when we know we've done something wrong, isn't it our nature to hide it? to want to hide it. You know, a number of years ago when my boys were little, it got awfully quiet around the house. And that, that's always a bad sign for a mom. You like some peace and quiet, but when that goes on too long, you know something's up. And so I began to look for them. And I remember opening the bathroom door and the entire bedroom and bathroom was covered in a white baby powder. And I, remember thinking, what have you done? What have you done? And look what God says to them. God asked them a question and the Lord called out, Adam, where are you? And now we've already said the very first question in all of scripture is one uh, given by Satan to plant a seed of doubt. Here's the very first question ever given by God. And here's what we need to think. Is it because, did God ask this question because he doesn't know the answer? Absolutely not, he's God. He knows every answer. He knows way before it happens what's gonna happen. He knew where he was. But what he needed was for Adam and Eve to fess up and to take a moment to look and reflect on their actions and what it had caused them. He needed them to verbalize it. So that day when I found my two little boys in the bathroom covered from head to toe in white, bed covered, uh, bathtub covered, everything covered in powder. My question was, what have you done? What have you done? Now, to be honest, looking around, I knew exactly what they had done. It wasn't because I didn't know the answer. It's because I needed them to reflect 
on the mess they had made. And God needs Adam and Eve to stop and reflect on the mess they have made. And he gives them a chance to come out of hiding. And look what happens. Then the Lord said to Adam, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He wasn't afraid because he was naked. He was embarrassed because he was naked. He was embarrassed because he was wearing a bunch of itchy, uncomfortable leaves. He was afraid because of his actions and his sin. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. He starts the blame game, doesn't it? God asked him a simple yes, no question. Have you eaten? The answer was either yes or no. Should have been yes. Yes, I have. Instead, I can see that he needed to use his finger, in fact two, to point blame. The woman over here that you, God, gave me. I'm pointing blame. Not here. It's over there and it's there. Because of that woman and because you gave her to me, I sinned. I ate. And then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Sisters, there's the defining moment that I want this story to be about. The serpent pointing blame. The serpent deceived me and I ate. What we could say, the serpent, the evil one deceived me and I sinned because that's what she meant. And so what is it that we learn from this story? If we can't find some takeaways in our own life, it's just a bizarre story for us. So I have some takeaways and I want you to think about these. And what I want you to do, you may have other takeaways. One of the beauties of scripture is that every time we read from God's word, we see it with different eyes. Maybe our circumstances are different, our, uh, our ages are different, but we see it with different eyes. Here are some takeaways I came up with. With. I want you to see if you can find others. The first takeaway, sisters, we don't live in a bubble. We do not live in a bubble and our sins and our actions affect other people. Never ever in the history of humanity has one act, one bite caused such a trickle down effect for humanity because what Eve did on that day still affects us today. So our actions affect other people. There's our first lesson. Another one, I think there's strength in numbers and it's worth mentioning here. It sounds as if when Satan tempted Eve, she was all alone. Perhaps he chose that because there is strength in numbers. And so sisters, remember that when you're tempted, when you're struggling, when you're weak, when you feel alone, reach out to people who, and others, other women, mentors, friends, family, who can strengthen you, who can walk that journey with you and help you overcome, be transparent, be real. I was listening to a song on the radio coming and it said, there's no failure, no fall, no sin he doesn't already know. So let the truth be told. Reach out to other people with those, that truth that you are hurting, you are tempted, and you need strength and to carry on. Then again, another one, Eve gave the serpent, the evil one, the gift of time. Don't give evil the gift of your time. Walk away. She allowed him for six verses of scripture to convince her and to plant a seed of doubt of God's greatness in her mind. Had she walked away at the beginning, none of this would happen. So do not give the evil one the gift of time. Our father also spends all of his time taking care of us. Think of the th ways that he shows his love to us. He hears our prayers. He offers forgiveness. He offers protection in so many ways we don't see. He gives miracles that we don't even know about. He spends all of his time with so many elements of making our lives victorious in him. But the deceiver, guess what? He spends all of his time on one thing, trying to deceive us. It's his only job and he does it well. Sin means 
that God, it doesn't mean God doesn't care for us anymore. He most certainly still loves us and cares for us. If you go back to this, the, the story that we read and continue on, what you find is before God dishes out consequences, which is another lesson we learn, God loves us, but consequences still exist. God put some incredible consequences upon Adam and Eve, but one of the greatest was they had to leave this beautiful garden. But before before he kicks them out, he gives a loving gesture, and he probably saw them scratching and itching and uncomfortable in twigs and leaves, and he said, before I kick you out, I will make you comfortable clothes. And I think that's just a sign of his love. He still loves us, even though we sin, and he redeems us and calls us back. And God always, always provides us a way out. I want you to write down 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says, um, God is faithful. Who, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will make a way of escape and you may be able to bear it. So remember, if only Eve had recalled the greatness of God and not allowed that little seed of doubt to be planted in who God was, if she could have remembered God is powerful, God is mighty, God is her maker, God loves her, God provides the strength and a way out our world would have been much better. I hope this has opened your eyes to a defining moment of deception. Uh, unfortunately for Eve, the mother of all living creatures, when we think about her, sometimes the defining moment we go to is her deception. But gratefully, God offers us many remedies to keep us from falling to the deception of the serpent. Ladies, I hope you have a great day day. Blessings on your week, and I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Bye-bye.